Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Amanda Pittman and I talk about faith, confidence, and lifestyle from a Christian woman's perspective. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about the seven signs of a Pharisee spirit. This is gonna help you to discern legalism and a spirit of religion. Now, when I say a spirit of, you can think of this as someone who embodies the characteristics of a Pharisee in the Bible. It's really important that we don't embody the spirit of a Pharisee because it is a very anti-Christ spirit. What do I mean by that? Well, when you look at the life of Jesus, the people who opposed Jesus most and the people who crucified Jesus were the Pharisees. They were anti Jesus. They were anti Christ. They opposed his ministry. It is so dangerous because it will sneak into churches. It'll sneak into friendships. It'll sneak into different relationships, but it actually chokes out the freedom that Christ purchased for us on the cross. And it places the responsibility back onto the person. And it's a weight we simply can't bear. Whether you or someone you know has dealt with this spirit, I still believe that you can find freedom in Christ. So without further ado, let's jump in. The first sign that someone has a Pharisee spirit is that they look holy on the outside. They look holy on the outside, but not necessarily on the inside. Their holiness will always be an outward display. They're very perfectionistic. They're very performance based. They have such high standards for how they should appear on the outside. The reason why they do this is that they want to feel worthy and deserving. They believe that their worth and their value is dependent on what they do. So therefore, they're gonna try and have the appearance of holiness so that nobody will be able to say, you're not worthy, you're not valuable, you're not good enough. They're gonna be able to earn that value, they'll be able to earn that worthiness based on their own works, skills, abilities, and efforts. Now let me show you this in scripture. I'm gonna read from Matthew chapter 23, verses 25 through 28. Jesus is saying this, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. This is one of the things that makes the spirit of religion and the spirit of a Pharisee quite dangerous, is that it's not easy to detect from the outside. From the outside, this person will look holy, they will look like they're on fire for God, they will look very reverent, they will look inspiring, someone who you would want to emulate, they will look like they are the example that you should follow. But you're not actually able to know the inner thoughts in their hearts. You may not know their inner motivations, why they're doing what they're doing, why they're saying what they're saying, why they're showing what they're showing. You will not be able to discern who a Pharisee is or who someone is who's genuinely on fire for God based on the outward appearance. Man looks at the appearance, but God looks at the heart. And this is why they love having the form of godliness. They love looking like this on the outside because to the untrained eye, nobody is gonna be able to see the greed, the hypocrisy, or the dirt in their own heart. They look holy on the outside, but they are not holy on the inside. Sign number two that someone has a Pharisee spirit is that they are self-righteous and self-referencing. They're very critical. So they're critical of themselves and therefore they're critical of others. They have very high standards and many times they're able to uphold th those standards from the outside looking in. But the thing is this, even though they have high moral standards, they have low relational mercy. They have low relational grace. So they'll put these heavy weights on other people saying, you should do this. Here's how, the, how your life should look. Here's what you should eat. Here's what you should wear. Here's what you should say. Here's what you should think. But when somebody falls short of their standard that they have set themselves, then they will condemn that person for not being able to meet it. They do not show grace towards others. They do not show mercy towards others. Let me show you about this in scripture. I'll read from Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. 
to some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. During this time, tax collectors were very sleazy, they betrayed others, and so they're looked down upon and seen as sinners. So the Pharisee was the one who looked good and the tax collector was the one who looked bad. Let's continue. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. As you can see, this Pharisee was self-referencing and self-righteous. Oh, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like the adulterers. I thank you I'm not like this tax collector. So if you're someone who encounters another person who has the spirit of a Pharisee, you'll never feel good enough in their presence if you can't meet their standards. And if you do meet their standards, they'll move the mile marker so that they can attain a higher standard that they know you can't meet. And that mile marker will continue to move so that you'll continue to feel morally inferior to them. And at the end of the day, it won't feel like freedom. It will feel like bondage. We can't do it in our own strength. We can't do it in our own might. We can't be worthy enough. And that's good news because Jesus can and Jesus did. Religion says do, 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 but relationship says done. In Christ, the work is done. If you're encountering someone like this or an environment like this, a church like this, a denomination like this, you will feel bound. But once you recognize the freedom you have in Christ and you separate yourself, you'll recognize how light, how airy, how free, and how amazing it feels. And that's my hope for you. Sign number three that someone has a Pharisee spirit is that they impose their own convictions and their own standards and rules on others. They do this to set themselves apart as superior. They always want to feel better than based on what they can do or say. Many times when someone is like this, they'll be very formulaic about what they believe they deserve. So I did one, two, three. I did ABC. This is why I have this amazing life. If you are experiencing bad things in life, you deserve it. If you're experiencing good things in life, you deserve it. Why? Because you're doing the right thing or you're doing the wrong thing based on their own convictions and their own standards. They know that very few people can reach that. It creates this distance between them and us and will help them to feel like you have to rely on them in order to find a sense of validation or worthiness. It sets them as the teachers, the masters, the rabbis, someone you should depend on rather than depending on Christ himself. They would love for you to look at them and put the spotlight on them rather than putting the spotlight on Christ. But here's the tricky part. They'll put the spotlight on themselves, but then they'll have this false humility. It's pride wrapped in false humility. They want to appear as humble because they know that that's the righteous thing to do. But they'll put on false humility because they are actually prideful. They actually feel superior. They feel better than everyone else because they are more humble than everyone else or they are more lowly than everyone else or they give more than everyone else or they eat less, they fast more. Maybe they're better parents than everyone else or maybe they go to church more than everyone else or maybe they read the Bible more than everyone else. Whatever it may be, they have this false humility about them, but it comes from a place of superiority and pride. All right, let me show you this in the scripture. I'll read from Mark 7, verses 5 through 9. Here's what it says. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating food with their defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. 
You have let go of the commands of God and are holding your own human traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. As you can see, someone with a Pharisee spirit will be led maybe by tradition of people or their own traditions. This is how I run my marriage. And if you don't run your marriage like me, then you don't have a godly marriage. This is how I dated. If you don't date like me, then you don't date a godly way. This is how I parent. If you don't parent like me, then you don't parent in a godly way. All of these things are examples of setting human standards, human rules, and making them the law for everyone else. These people are quick to feel a conviction about something and saying, oh, because I feel a conviction about this, you should have that conviction. Pause. Someone who actually trusts in the Spirit of God, someone who actually trusts the Lord, will believe that if they pray for you, and if God is who he says he is, and if you truly belong to God, you'll come around on that. But putting this heavy burden of following your conviction about watching this movie or listening to this music or dating this way, whatever it may be, if they actually trust the Lord, they'll believe that you'll come around by the power of the Spirit, but not by their own convictions and pointing the finger and making you feel unworthy. Sign number four that someone is led by the spirit of a Pharisee is that they're driven by rivalry, jealousy, and contempt. Like I said, these people always want to be better than, seen as perfect, seen as the example, seen as those that everybody else can turn to. If they feel threatened by someone else, they'll feel very jealous. That jealousy will lead to anger and bitterness and if it goes unchecked, it will even lead into a murderous spirit. We see this with the Pharisees in the Bible. They were jealous that all of these crowds were following Jesus and they were learning from Jesus and he was their rabbi and they were being discipled by him rather than looking to them. They were so used to having the power, they were used to having the control, and they were used to having the attention. They loved having the spotlight on themselves. They loved the attention. And so when Jesus came, he threatened that. Now, a great biblical example of this that most people overlook is in the story of the prodigal son. I want you to rock with me here. In this illustration, I want you to think of the older brother as the Pharisee and the younger brother as someone who's actually graced and loved and accepted by God. So in this parable, the younger son asks for his father's inheritance in advance up front, and then he goes, leaves his father's house, and squanders all of it in really wild living. Then he comes to his senses. He's eating with the pigs. He realizes, I'm not about this life. Then whenever he comes home, the father opens him with arms wide open, gives him a big hug, gives him a ring on his finger, throws him this big party and this big celebration, and ultimately he's just happy that his son is home. This is a picture of our grace, our sonship, and our inheritance in Christ. The older brother was jealous and he held the younger brother in contempt. He doesn't even call him his brother. He says, this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home and you kill the fattened calf for him. Okay, I think at first glance, you can feel like, oh wow, your, your concerns are quite legitimate. Like this isn't quite fair. But here's the thing, favor is not fair. Grace is not earned. Grace is not merited. Now, when you encounter someone who has the spirit of a Pharisee, they'll feel like this freedom that you have, this grace that you have, the favor of God on your life, the anointing, the hand of God on your life, you don't deserve it. It threatens me because I've done all of these things and I'm not where you are. I've done all of these things and I'm not getting the grace that you have. And so they'll feel this jealousy rise up because they feel threatened. They feel like you're taking the place that they have rightfully earned and deserved and you've done nothing. And it's the truth. We have done nothing to deserve God's grace. In fact, we've done the complete opposite. And yet, when we come back home and we say, God, I want you, I want to belong to you, I want to be in your home, I'm, I know I'm not deserving, what God does is he wraps us in his loving arms and he gives us a grace, an identity, an inheritance that we don't deserve. And someone with a Pharisee spirit hates that. 
We also saw this with the Pharisees. Whenever Jesus was welcoming the tax collectors, eating with sinners, healing the sick, raising the dead, even some who weren't even Jews, they felt as if, what in the world? This entire time I've been upkeeping the law, I've been observing the Sabbath, I've been praying, I've been fasting. I'm so holy, I deserve acceptance from God. They should not be acceptable to God. They should not be welcomed by God. But that's what Jesus came to demolish. He came to demolish the self-righteous religious system so that all of our righteousness can be found not in our own ability, but in what Jesus has done. So if you're walking in this freedom and you encounter someone who has this religious spirit, a spirit of a Pharisee, you'll feel as if they're holding you in contempt. They're turning up their nose to you. I think the moment you recognize it, then you'll no longer be offended by the person, but you'll oppose the spirit. Sign number five that someone has a spirit of a Pharisee is that they are suspicious and accusatory towards others. This person is looking for someone to mess up or to trip up. They're quick to point the finger. They're always looking at everybody else, but not never pointing at themselves. They assume the worst of others based on very limited information. They're suspicious and they make these snap judgments. They'll take one thing and they'll judge an entire person's character based on it. Where do we see this in scripture? Well, in Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 through 32, Jesus heals a man who was demon possessed and he was blind and mute. And what do the Pharisees do? Rather than praising God for this incredible miracle, they're suspicious of him. They accused Jesus for working for the devil. And then Jesus was like, this is, this is ridiculous logic. It's impossible for Satan to cast out Satan. A kingdom that's divided against itself will fall. Someone who has the spirit of a Pharisee will use ridiculous logic that sounds religious in order to accuse you. Maybe they'll accuse you of having a spirit. Maybe they'll accuse you of not being good enough. They'll accuse you of being carnal. They'll accuse you of being prideful. Maybe you walk in this great authority and then they'll say, oh, this authority comes from this other spirit or this authority comes because, oh, they think they're all that in a bag of chips. Rather than thinking, well, maybe this authority actually comes from Christ. Maybe they're actually walking in the boldness and the fullness of what God earned for them, what he died for. So it's so important to recognize the spirit in others so that we don't wrongly accuse someone who God is using of being used by the enemy or being uh, motivated by the flesh. We don't always know that. That's why it's important for us to seek God ourselves, go to the spirit and say, God, what do you say? Is this person working for you? What am I missing? What do I need to understand about this? I don't want to judge based on my own biases, but I want to judge based on your truth. Sign number six that someone has the spirit of a Pharisee is that they practice piety and asceticism. Now, I love the word asceticism. It's just a really fun word. But for those of you who are not familiar with the word, let me read the definition to you. The definition is severe self-discipline and avoidance of all forms of indulgence, typically for religious reasons. So for someone who practices asceticism, they're the type of person who They'll say, oh, I'm not going to be doing this. I won't be attending that. They're, they make a really big fuss about what they don't do. Oh, you won't, you won't see me hanging out with that person. You'll never catch me drinking. And they make this big fuss of it because it looks like they're denying themselves. It'll look like they're just denying their flesh, dying to themselves. It may even look like they're picking up their cross, but it's not led by the Spirit. Here's an example of it. In Colossians Chapter two, verses 20 through 23, it says, since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belonged to this world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with the things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. In other words, God never said that. This is people who's making this stuff up. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom. They will always appear real, real nice and holy, okay? They have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Here's a good example of this. Someone who says, I won't hold hands, I won't kiss. You won't see me out alone with someone while I'm dating. But 
Meanwhile, you may even be struggling with porn in your private life. This doesn't mean that you're not struggling with lust. This is asceticism at its core. It's this idea that, oh, I don't do these things, therefore I'm holy, therefore I'm doing all of the right things and you should be doing it too. And if you're not, you're not holy. When in actuality, somebody else could be really denying their flesh, staying away from temptations, even in their mind, even in their heart. And this is a private thing that they never even advertise and God is so pleased with them. Ultimately, this is a trust in the flesh. They're saying, if I can deny myself, if I can have this rigid self-discipline, then why can't you? Why aren't you as good as I am? It almost gives them permission to look down on others because if I can do this and you can't, what does that say about you? And what does that say about me? This very much so gives holier than thou. When you encounter someone who's like this, you'll always feel unworthy in comparison. You'll never feel good enough. And the thing is, it's not your fault. It's the spirit. It's this accusatory spirit. Once you recognize that, then you'll stop feeling so bad about yourself and start interceding for them. And last but not least, we've come to the end. Sign number seven, that someone has a Pharisee spirit. At the core of it, they lack a revelation of sonship. They lack a revelation of being a daughter of the king. Going back to the parable of the prodigal son, the older son that represents this legalistic religious mentality, this Pharisee spirit, they felt as if they were a slave to the father. And because they were obedient to him, they were deserving of their rightful place. However, that younger son did not feel deserving. They squandered everything. It was the relationship to their father, the fact that they are a son made them rightful heirs to what the father gave them. We are not worthy of the things that our father gives us. However, we are rightful heirs once we become sons and daughters of God. This is about our relationship to him. And those who are still bound to this religious spirit or this legalism, they cannot comprehend the freedom that you have as a son or a daughter when you're not doing all the things or you hadn't done all the things to earn it or deserve it. They're lacking a revelation of the fact that, hey, if they ran and came back to God, they would have that too. It's not about everything that they could do right, but it's about the fact that they belong to him. In the same way that my kids, they could do the right thing, they can do the wrong thing. I could be displeased with them, I could be pleased with them. However, that won't change my love for them. They're my kids. I don't command them because I want them to be my slaves. I want them to have this beautiful relationship with me where they can come to me, they can trust me. God's love and acceptance isn't based on our own merit, our own regulations, our own standards that we meet, but it's based on his love, his grace, his kindness, his mercy. That is the gospel. Let me leave you with this scripture. In Romans 8 verses 14 through 17, it says this. For all who are led by the Spirit of God, not the flesh, not self-righteousness, are sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by whom we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Listen, you do not have to be bound by the spirit of slavery. You do not have to be bound by the spirit of fear. You don't have to be bound by this Pharisee, legalistic, self-righteous, religious spirit you have freedom in christ because you belong to him because you're his son because you're his daughter that's where freedom in christ comes from and the sooner you get that revelation the sooner the heavy burden and the heavy weight will be lifted whether someone close to you has the spirit whether it is an organization somebody that you follow a teacher whether it's a denomination I encourage you break free from that. Recognize the spirit of slavery and then say, God, I don't want this anymore. Give me a freedom. Give me a revelation of sonship in you. 
show me what it means to have the spirit of adoption and to have a spirit of freedom that calls out Abba Father so that I don't feel superior or inferior based on what I do or don't do, but I feel worthy because I am one with you and because I belong to you. Guys, I pray that this video was so helpful for you. I pray that it opens up your eyes so that you can see with spiritual eyes and you can find freedom in every single way and that your confidence can ultimately be in Christ. If you like this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. If you're new to this channel, make sure you subscribe, leave a comment, and I will see you in my next video. Bye guys.